My name is Arthur Scheppinger. I'm uh, the head of database engineer within Spillgames. Spillgames is a company from the Netherlands. Uh, not many of you might have heard from Spillgames before. We actually do gaming, obviously. Uh, but I hope at the end of the presentation we'll be given a bit more insight on what this company is all about. The presentation will consist of three major parts. Uh, first of all, I'm going to give an introduction on spill games. Then I'm going to tell you a bit more about my own department, the database engineering department. And third of all, I will be tell you a bit more about our new upcoming exciting project that has been promised within the, uh, within the talk. At the end of the presentation, I hope there will be a room for questions. So, who are we? Who is spill games? Well, uh, I think it would be best by telling you some facts about the company itself. Uh, the company was founded in 2001, that's already 11 years ago, and within this 11 years we grew from 2 employees to 350 employees. Uh, in the beginning we were doing uh, mostly casual portals, but we're now slowly shifting towards social gaming. We're also doing about 170 million uniques per month, that's quite a lot of uh, users coming to our portals, but to give you an impression of what we do on our corporate website, that's only 100,000 unique vis visitors per month. So there might actually be a reason why I never heard from Spill Games before. So where did we get these 170 million users from? Uh, well, we have a worldwide 40, language, uh, 40 localized uh, portals in 19 languages alone. And on these portals we mainly use the, the casual and social games. Uh, and apart from these 170 million users, we also have about 40 million uh, registered users playing our social games, having a lot of interactions with our databases. And fortunately, it's not all direct to DB. So how do we keep these 170 million users interested? Well, we divided up all the portals in three major brands. You can see uh, it's girls, it's teens and family. On the left you can see the, the, the girls brand. It's pink and it's uh, targeted at girls in the age between 8 and 12. And it mainly consists of dress-up games, cooking games, creation games. And an interesting fact to know is that about 60% of all the girls between 8 and 12 in the US visit girlschoolgames.com. In the middle you can see our teens brand where we uh, target uh, a higher category of, uh, uh, of children. Um, they're mainly uh, targeted at children in between 10 and 16. Also, the games are a bit more targeted to, towards this age group. On the right, you can see our family brand, and it's obviously uh, targeted at families, so mothers and children play together, and therefore it also got the largest variety in games. The games on these portals, uh, they are created in our own in-game in-house uh, in -game, in -house game studios or licensed from partner, partners or made within uh, a partnership with a social game provider. And now I'm going to show you a couple of the games we're using on our portals. First of all, our most popular game within the US is Pet Party. You can create your own virtual pet. Um, haven't played with other pets. And we have all our social games like Forest Story where you can run your own tribe. We also have non-social uh, games like for instance Lose the Heat where uh, you can race against others or you can outrun the police. We also have an ever popular title called Uphill Rush. It's made in an in-game house studio. In-house in game studio, sorry. Um, and it already received its third sequel so far. But our ever, most ever popular game is Bubble Shooter. We have been running this game for years and years and years, and we haven't found a title that is more popular than this. So all in all, we have in-house game studios, we have partnerships with social game studios, and we have a lot of licensed games. Spill Games itself is growing, and it's growing fast, and faster and faster. We have had uh, a growth of 30% year over year. And in this graph you can see at the last row that the increasing number of employees actually keeps up with uh, the, the number of monthly active users. And also the same happens to our database cluster. It keeps on growing. And why is that important? Because our growth is also reflected in the number of database servers. So we need to expand 
our database clusters that we need to expand our database engineering department. So what about the database engineering department? First of all, there was no database engineering department when I joined systems engineering as a DBA. And there was absolutely no focus on whatsoever regarding databases. No focus on performance, structure, backups. And they were only looking <coughs> two weeks ahead in time. So servers weren't there when uh, we needed to deploy a new database. Um, or a new application came up and nothing was prepared to do the, uh, to do the deployment of the application. So what we learned in that early phase was that we were doing way too many migrations to new hardware. We had old hardware, we needed replacements, or applications that grew incredibly fast that we had to migrate to new hardware, and then do it again a couple of months later. It took a lot of time. We had a lot of issues with master-master setups. Um, developers only used uh, one master to do writes and reads, and have the other one as a gold spare. So once one of the masters would fail, it would immediately put all the workload on the other master. And since he, one of the masters was already failing because it was getting too many connections or uh, having timeouts, that would also mean that the other master would just die instantly. Not a very fun thing to do uh, on a Saturday night at 4 o'clock. Um, we also had a lot of uh, problems with uh, performance. We didn't see anything coming until uh, the servers were failing. So why were they failing? Nobody. Let's just do post-mortem and verify whatever was the cause. <coughs> so we tried to professionalize the department. We started to plan ahead up to three months in time. Um, that meant that we had to buy servers uh, in stock and keep them in stock just in case that we actually might deploy a new application. We also tried to improve our database platform, uh, first of all by just upgrading from MySQL 5.0 to 5.1, uh, getting backups in order, uh, uh, getting more uh, available systems. We tried to reduce the number of repetitive tasks. We were doing a lot of tasks uh, that were coming up each time when we de deployed a new server, and we tried to automate them whenever we were capable of doing that. Also, we tried to improve the monitoring system. Um, why was that important? We only had one single monitoring system, and a single monitoring system means that you can't see everything. I'll get back to that a bit later. We tried to forecast our own growth, and this forecasting was nothing compared to what uh, uh, the Baron Swartz um, presented yesterday. It was more or less like looking at the number of reads and rides, what to expect within a week, month, year in time, and then look back and evaluate if that was still the case. If we uh, were growing faster than we anticipated for, then we needed to change our forecast. And obviously we tried to expand our department you can't do everything by just a couple of uh, DBAs. So we try to uh, get specialized roles like a data warehouse engineer, uh, a specialized DBA, a database specialist, working together with developers. Another good learning we had in the beginning was that LDAP isn't suitable for the web. Well, see a lot of black stars. We were using LDAP as our profile system because the, the development department didn't think MySQL would be suitable to serve all the all our profile information. So we had this <coughs> idea where we just started up a multi-master replication system within LDAP. According to the LDAP specifications, it is possible we were using 389 directory server, but this multi-master replication wasn't exactly what we expected it to be. It actually meant that if you replicate from one server to the other, it would set a semaphore. And once the semaphore was set, the other servers weren't able to replicate to that single server. Meaning you get uh, the next... Um, the next time it would actually start replicating was 60 seconds later. In a web environment, that's not th something you actually want to have. You want to have your data instantaneously. So, let me ditch that 
ID and we get back to the good old master master setup like we were used to run in uh, in a MySQL environment. Both masters were writable and that is a good slave to uh, the read slaves underneath it in case we need to scale up the number of reads. So we started to scale up the number of reads and then we started to scale up the number of reads. By then we were only doing 8 million profiles. And if you have a projection in the upcoming year to grow with an additional 20, that's not going to be sufficient. So we hired Percona to get us a very good MySQL-based solution. And it helped us really well. We only replaced it with two single servers, set up in a master, master environment, and one slave underneath it for data warehouse purposes. Another thing we improved in that period was the, the, the way of cloning. We were doing uh, cloning through LVM snapshots. And it took us four hours on average to actually get the data from one server to the other, have it catch up, uh, set it up within replication. So then we found out that this new Inno Backup X with NetCut and TAR and the script would actually give us a good ability to do quick cloning. Why was that important? Well, we could now initiate a copy from the master to the slave and send files back, apply the bin lock, and set up the replication all automatically. And it did that within one hour per 100 gigabyte. So that's a very good quick solution to get another machine as a slave or maybe once you get a hardware failure, to replace the broken hardware with a new machine and have high, availa high availability within, a, within an hour. It's also foolproof. You only need to provide uh, the, the server name. You need to provide uh, once yes that you actually want to do it, and yes, I do want to set up replication. It can also be a run on active masters. So once you have that hardware failure and you only have one server left, it would be a very good thing to get high availability as quickly as possible. We also improved our monitoring system. Why was that important? Well, different monitoring systems give different insights. We use high uh, availability monitoring with Nagios. We use performance monitoring with Cacti. We now use a near real-time monitoring with Monjog. And also application monitoring like New Relic. It gives us a lot of insight into what the code is actually doing and what the database look like from the application perspective. I'll give you, um, sorry, it also gives us the ability to find that problem actually before it eventually could lead to an outage. So once we have this early problem detection, we could actually act upon it. Now I'm going to show you some graphs where you can actually see that uh, having multiple monitoring systems will give you more insight. In this case, you can see that the number of queries has suddenly increased, and the, the server was capable of keeping up, um, because that most of the queries were within the one millisecond to 10 millisecond range. So we didn't find the cost by looking at this graph, and neither by looking at the number of contact switches. But actually, this graph immediately shows, showed us what was happening. This is a, a graph by New Relic, and the vertical bars are deployments of code. You can see that the third vertical bar from the left, uh, once that happened, immediately the number of queries increased. So we tried to look at the deployment, what was happening with, with the deployment, but we couldn't find the cause within the deployment. We even tried to roll it back in the, in the next uh, vertical bar. That didn't solve the problem. So the, the problem wasn't inside the code. Actually, the problem was inside a configuration change made by the release engineer, just following whatever was stated in the release notes. We referred to that config change, and all of a sudden, the number of queries decreased. Basically, what he did was uh, uh, lowering the, the uh, time to live for all memcache items, meaning all new queries coming in for non-memcache hits would immediately hit the database. And immediately timeouts so of the next request came in and so forth and so forth. So it's very important to have such insight. <coughs> We're also seeing a lot of growing pains, uneven growth within our, uh, within our functional sharded environment. 
uh, some applications were doing different query patterns than the others. And, well, for instance, we had one instance that actually was doing a lot of writes, uh, and we were only scaling out the reads. So how do you scale out the writes? By vertical share, by scaling or by sharding. Sharding requires a lot of uh, changes in your application layer, so we didn't go for that solution. Also, we had a, a, a big problem with write-only databases. There are some applications that only do writes to the database. Uh, they write their data to memcache, so once uh, a connection comes in, it will immediately be cached. But just in case memcache isn't there, we have it write to the database. Then we got some other problems with our services-oriented architecture, where some servers call another server, and that server service might call another service. And that causes a lot of connection spawning. Each of every of those services will open up a connection to the database by default. That might be a bad practice, but we have to live with it. Within our environment, we have uh, too many servers, too many processes to actually do anything else than just have connection spawning. We can't just use uh, um, we can't use persistent connections because if we otherwise immediately the server would die due to the number of connections made. Also, we were seeing a lot of problems with its connection spawning. Uh, the server is getting busy by opening up more connections, uh, connections queuing, like, uh, getting a three second timeout. So we tried to adjust this a bit by uh, uh, upgrading the number of OPA file descriptors and changing a bit with uh, the, the backlog setting. So now we start to outgrow our own startup phase, that's where we are now. We try to anticipate a bit more in time. Uh, I'm going to tell you a bit more about that in the, uh, the new upcoming uh, in our new upcoming project. We now try to acknowledge our own shortcomings. We know that sharding is inevitable, so we have to work upon it. So we have to come up with a solution or an alternative. And also, we do not want to commit to one single solution anymore, what we did in the past. So we try to be flexible. One of the other things is that we do not wish to just plan for reads and writes alone. We want to know that we want, uh, how many instances of MySQL we are going to run. So we try to plan for the capacity of an instance. How many users can we actually put on a MySQL server? Another thing is that we have to start thinking globally because we grow so fast, we can't keep all the databases within that one data center we're using. Also, we want to bring the data as close as possible to the end user. Why? Because our users are globally spread uh, across the world. So, if you have a search as you type functionality, it will cause a lot of latency for the end user to get actually to the database and get the response back. So, now, what are we going to do within our new upcoming project? Well, on the left you can see our old structure, after serving it for many years, uh, it, it's getting a bit over complex. Therefore, we're now building a much more structured architecture, as you can see on the left, that we hopefully will just scale horizontally. So what's wrong with our old structure? Well, it's all functionally sharded. We had some natural growth within our company. It, we get more and more functions within the portals, and each and uh, every one will require a new application. And once we get a new application, we create a new database, and once that database gets too much hits, we, we just isolate it to a separate cluster, scale out the cluster, so we got a separation of database functions. So we have a profiles database, my scores database, Commons database, etc. I could go on for all 40 applications. What are the advantages of such a system? Well, it's very simple. The application itself is just a few lines of code. You can easily find any problems within the, the within the, the database, or you can try to solve problems easily. But the disadvantages are much worse. We get a lot of uneven growth. Already said it a bit. Uh, there's a huge difference in query patterns. Some databases get joins, others uh, might even suffer from uh, uh, too many indexes. 
There's also no data consistency between all those databases. If a profile gets removed for some reason, it doesn't remove actually all the comments or all the images uploaded by the user. That's because there's no clear ownership of the data. Who's the owner of the data? Is that the user or is that the portal? Is that the game? Also, we can only do capacity planning on the number of reads and writes within that application. And therefore, horizontal scaling is also very difficult. So, this is the old, complex, functionally sharded application. And we want to go to this picture. As you can see, it consists of three major layers. And we'll tell you a bit more about them in detail. Our most uh, important, uh, our most important comp component of this is our bucket model. So what is this bucket model all about? It's an abstraction layer between the database and the data model. It's within our application, where we actually do not connect the data model to the, to the actual representation to the end user. Each and every record has its own global uh, identifier. This global identifier can be either a portal, a game, or uh, a user. Also, this allows us to create different buckets for one function. So if we have the comment section, we can actually uh, uh, make multiple buckets for uh, a user, or a game, or maybe a portal itself. Also, the, um, sorry, I already mentioned that. Uh, what are the advantages of this system? Well, it makes us very flexible. It allows us to actually make a database uh, backend independent. So we can use for one bucket uh, MySQL server, but could use Redis for a different bucket. It also allows us to do, uh, within MySQL, seamless schema changes and upgrades. By just creating a new view on the bucket, we can just apply that to all new incoming users and whenever a user updates his or her uh, data, it will automatically be migrated to the new schema. We can also shard both on functional and GID level, making it not only horizontal, uh, making it uh, more flexible to shard. Why is this important? Because we can now do an even distribution of our queries. So we can mix and match some of the buckets, and then some of the buckets will actually be doing a lot of joints, and others might actually be only primary key lookups. And this way, we can actually create a capacity planning on the number of users we want to serve. It also allows us to do asynchronous writes. Why is that important? The asynchronous writes normally means that you just write data and you tell the end user, well, it's okay, we just make sure that this gets saved. Not all of our data is capable of doing that, but there's a lot of data, like a, a comment, where the end user doesn't necessarily need the confirmation from the database that his comment was actually saved. <coughs> it also allows us to do transparent data migration. Uh, we have several ways of uh, migrating data from the old functional shards to the new functional shards. I'll show you that in some pictures later. And it also allows us to migrate a user from one shard to the other. The disadvantages, well, it's harder to find data. If you have this complex structure, you need to do a couple of lookups to actually get to the, to the data you're, uh, you're looking for. That also means that the data warehouse needs a different approach. We're now going for a, a message queue-like solution instead of just loading up all the data from one database into our, into our data warehouse. So how does this work? Well, we globally shard on uh, GID, that means that we know within the GID, which is a, 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 has, a, has some function telling you where actually this user is located. So you know that the, the user is, for instance, located within the, the European data center, and this user wants to be friends with someone in the US, in the US data center. That means that we can actually make a, a intercluster communication between Europe and the US to actually write its data into the US data center. Within that data center, uh, one of the layers will actually do the lookup of the GID and see on which shard actually this data resides. So that's the double lookup. To get a bit more into the different layers, 
At the top you can see the owner router. The owner router basically uh, knows which buckets belong to what uh, applications. And what will happen is that, um, sorry, it will actually uh, get you to the correct owner pipeline. So the bucket is owned by, uh, by this GID. That also means that we create atomicity and that, that's absolutely necessary because we want to have a process being the owner of the data. Within this pipeline, the bucket can be implemented in various ways. It can be a persistent bucket or a, a, a memory-only bucket. A memory-only bucket is within, the, the, uh, within Erlang itself. It will also create its own cache. And then once it actually needs to write to the database, it will just ask the shard router on which shard does this user reside. So how do we actually migrate from our old system with a legacy API and some functionally sharded databases to our new structure. Well, we place a new API in front of it, connecting to the old API with the legacy adapter, and then we're going to create our new applications. And each of those applications will then connect to the old functionally sharded databases to get its data. We verify both outputs, and if everything is okay, we start writing to our new GAD-based shards. Once we have started doing that, we can actually verify if the data is written correctly by just reading from both uh, clusters and see if the data is equal in both clusters. Once we have verified that everything is okay, we can remove the old legacy API and reuse all the hardware for our new functionally sharded, uh, our new GID sharded environment. Another thing we're now going to do is master-master sharding. It sounds a bit weird. I've seen it yesterday uh, described a bit at Etsy. Uh, each of the cluster uh, will consist of two masters containing two shards. We're going to write our data interleaved, so meaning that user 1 will actually be on shard 1 and user 2 will be on shard 2. It will then be replicated to each other, meaning we create high availability for both shards. Why is that important? Well, currently we have a problem that not all machines that are hot, um, that are a hot backup, uh, hot standby, actually is a hot standby, but it could be a cold standby. Also, this does not require us to warm up the server anymore. And we keep both masters active and warmed up. Then we add slaves for data, uh, data warehouse purposes and backups within one of our other data centers. So how are we going to implement this new architecture? Well, we're going to create a very huge airline cluster, meaning a lot of virtual machines on a lot of hardware, where every GID has its own worker process. So if you come into our environment, you will be assigned a worker process within this cluster. And that's your own very own worker process. And it will apply all the work done for you. It will even contain all the data that you own and that you, uh, it will contain all the data that you own cached. It also allows us to do inter-cluster communication. Why is that important? Well, we want to communicate between the data centers. We want to have uh, worker process A talk to worker process B to have them run more jobs. And it also offers us near linear scalability. What are the advantages of this system? Well, first of all, we can do Erlang node caching. It also allows us to do multiple backend connectors. We can now scale out with other solutions. We currently have a MySQL library, we have hammer sockets, but we could also use any other connector if wanted. It also allows us to do connection pooling. Remember, I told you that we have a lot of connections spawning. Well, with connection pooling, we set up a persistent connection between our Erlang cluster and the database. That means that we can limit the number of connections and we can scale it up if needed. What are the disadvantages? Well, the only thing I could come up with was a lightning talk I saw last year here at the conference by Josh Burgess. It's not sexy. 
actually, if I look at the whole project, I think it's rather sexy. So, if you actually think that you want to live in the Netherlands and you want to be sexy, come join us. Any questions? <coughs> Can you, uh, I guess, explain kind of just in general terms how, say, I make a request of your application, how that request goes through the various systems before the service? Um, well, at first, your, uh, your request would come in within the, the nearest data center. Okay. That means that you would get into the US data center in the, the San Francisco Bay Area, for instance. Uh, that request would be handled by your own worker process meaning your own, uh, which is tied to your GID. And that process will actually handle all requests you are doing. No, that speaks HTTP. It speaks HTTP, okay. yeah. Uh, what then happens if you do interactions with other users, it will connect to the other GID process of that user. That also means that if you want to do some connection with someone in Indonesia, you have to connect to our Singapore data center and that actually is the inter uh, intercluster communication. So that means that uh, from one data center it will go to the other, but most probably that will be done asynchronously in the background without you having to connect to the Indonesian data center. So in order to figure out how to connect or where to connect, the, the worker process for you has to go look up in, in some GID lookup worker. Yes. So, so this makes all the sense when you use the set The gameplay happens. Oh, sorry, could you speak a little bit louder? Yeah, yeah the, uh, the distribution of users and data centers makes perfect sense for gameplay. What, what about things like search? Right? Do you plan to aggregate all the data somewhere else? Um, it's a very good question. Currently, within our current structure, we have everything in one data center, so obviously everything is served from our own single uh, search instance. Um, but if it's, for instance, uh, the games are distributed across the world, so if it's a game search, it's easy because it's already in the data center. Uh, in terms of searches for users outside your data center, it will probably not be implemented because for most people it's not interesting to find someone in Indonesia. Most of our users are coming from a local market, and they want to remain within that local market. No? Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you.